Hello everyone, Germ here, and I am mentally diseased. Today I want to talk about something interesting I recently discovered. Two interesting things, really. A whole bunch of interesting things. Firstly, a Japanese manga about Jehovah's Witnesses. Who'd have thought? What a concept. XJW comic books. And afterward, I'd like to talk a bit about the XJW community in Japan and what's going on over in their neck of the woods. But first, the manga. It's a two-volume series collectively called The Cult, known as Jehovah's Witnesses by tamo -san. Evidently, it was a pretty controversial release for the publisher, but really successful in Japan. It was first published in 2018 and just made its American debut fully translated in English this year. I used to be a really big fan of manga, so I had to pick this up immediately. Like, what better way to revisit the favorite pastime of my youth than with a manga about my life when I used to read it? Huh. I'm also just really interested in what being a Jehovah's Witness is like in other countries, especially Asian countries where it's such a foreign concept, especially Japan. How in the world do you manage being a Jehovah's Witness in Japan? A country that is so hyper-focused on education, career, success, busyness. Being a Jehovah's Witness is nearly a full-time job as it is, and so much of what they stand for flies in the face of what most of us know Japan for. So the first volume is called The Day I Was Forced to Marry God, and the final volume is The Day I Divorced God. That's uh, quite some attention-grabbing titles there, if I do say so myself. This was originally a manga that the author, Tamo-san, ran on her personal blog. It gained some attention and was picked up by a publisher. It's the author's memoirs on how her family converted to Jehovah's Witnesses, what her experience was, and why she decided to leave. So, Tamo-san was converted when she was 10 years old after her mother sent her to study English with a Jehovah's Witness family that was using my book of of Bible stories to teach English. This wonderful book, my book of Bible stories, learn about English and genocide all at once. I mean, it does fit. Many years later, after getting baptized, growing up, and getting married, Tamo-san faces struggles with having a child. Despite some, uh, unhelpful words from fellow witnesses after a miscarriage, she finally carries a child to term. She thinks this is a gift from Jehovah, until a few years later, her son falls ill with a heart condition and needs to be allowed a blood transfusion in order to undergo the operation to save his life. Why would a loving God give her this gift only to take it back? Does she let him take it back? As we all know, blood transfusions are a major no-no for Jehovah's Witnesses. They all carry these cards saying no blood in their wallets in case they're ever... I don't know, unconscious after a car accident at the hospital and can't actually reject the blood transfusion themselves, they're pretty serious about it. Stories about blood transfusions are interesting because all Jehovah's Witnesses have this fancy fantasy in their heads about something like this happening and being commendable heroes by refusing the blood transfusion. This fantasy of martyrdom. You think it's going to happen and you'll make your stand and they'll put you on the stage at the convention to tell your courageous story. Or, better yet, you'll even die from it and your picture will be immortalized in one of their magazines celebrating your steadfastness. And no one is even sad that you died because they're going to see you in paradise anyway. This is something a lot of witnesses actually want to happen. Definitely not a cult. But when it comes down to that moment and you're facing real life or death, all of that is banished. That's when the entire fantasy of the doctrine of paradise, Armageddon, eternal life, it stops being this abstract idea you kind of daydream about all the time, and you're confronted with the question of whether or not this is something you really believe. Something you believe enough to let yourself, or your loved one, your child, die. When the doctors hand you that form of consent, you are placing your bets in your beliefs. And for a lot of people, <laughs> turns out that's not a gamble they're really willing to take. 
That's why Jehovah's Witnesses have hospital liaison committees. These are a bunch of guys in suits who show up at the hospital to pressure you into making sure you make the correct choice and to pressure the doctors into backing off about it. What I wasn't expecting was to find out that they are a bit more harsh about this policy in Japan. While it isn't a law, medical professionals generally follow a guideline that if the parent refuses a blood transfusion for a young child, they can decide to perform the transfusion anyway. Not only that, but they can begin procedures to suspend their parental rights and have the child taken away. These guidelines were put in place in 2008, triggered by a case in the 80s in which a 10-year-old Jehovah's Witness child died in Japan due to refusal to transfuse. It was determined to be medical neglect and child abuse. This is what their guidelines say. Keep in mind this is a Google translation. Some of the wording might be off and my understanding of it might be totally off, but this is what it says. Uh, when the parental authority refuses for a child under the age of 15 or has no medical judgment, if both parents refuse, the medical side is to strive to gain the understanding of parents and provide bloodless treatment as much as possible. Reasonable. But in the end, if blood transfusion is needed, do it. <laughs> That's just it, period, do it. They say no parental consent was obtained, rather the treatment was hindered. Hindered by the parent, I'm assuming is what they're saying here. In such a situation, notify the Child Guidance Center of Abuse, and then they outline the steps for uh, filing a petition for loss of custody. And then they say in the case of one parent agreeing to the transfusion and the other refuses, again, endeavor to work with them if you can, but in emergency, side with a parent who wishes to have a blood transfusion. My understanding of this is a little different from how it is here, and I believe many Western countries in general, like the doctors, they're not really happy about it, but they usually just listen to whatever the parents want. In America, the laws vary state by state, very complicated, very confusing, but usually if a doctor deems a blood transfusion as a necessary life-saving measure for a child, there are a lot of hoops to jump through coming down to getting a court order. A lot of roadblocks that you may not always have the time to deal with in a pressing emergency situation. So evidently, they can just freaking do it in Japan and deal with the aftermath later. Tamo-san's child is not taken away because her love for her child outweighs her love for her religion. And this is the tipping point where she begins to question things, not exactly when she made the choice to leave, but that's where it all began. And so that is what this first volume here is about. The second volume, The Day I Divorce God, is a series of vignettes about the aftermath of leaving a high control group like the Jehovah's Witnesses, trying to reintegrate into society, learning how to make friends, participating in holidays and cultural rituals you've never done before, conflict with family who are still Jehovah's Witnesses, and that moment I think that a lot of us that have been out for a while can identify with when you think you've forgotten about it, you're doing good, and then a memorial invite shows up in the mail and you're triggered and you're flying back or you know, you see their carts parked at the corner and it's like, oh God, here we go. And finally, in the end, discovering the incredible XJW community where she learns to unpack all the trauma she buried and help others as she can. Since these were written for a general Japanese audience, there's a lot of explaining about what Jehovah's Witnesses do and think and all that kind of stuff. This is something you would expect anyway out of any major XJW publication that's meant for a wide public release, but you have to remember that Jehovah's Witnesses are a relatively new concept in Japan, and Christianity is not the norm there. We've had Witnesses here since the 1800s. They didn't really begin to spread in Japan until the 50s, 60s, after World War II ended, and Japan was in the middle of this cultural shift out of nationalism into a focus on economic affluence. Brother Lloyd Barry, who served on the governing body until he finished his earthly course in 1999, was a missionary and was sent across the world to spread the kingdom good news. Brother Nord come down he knew of the troubles in Japan and he'd asked for volunteers to go to Japan. Some, so some 70 of the 108 uh, volunteered to go to Japan. He decided that was too many, but he selected a group of 28 to learn the Japanese language while the others were all learning French. 
So we were well prepared to go to Japan, but uh, after we graduated, well, you couldn't get into Japan. It was just after the war, and anyone who went there had to have a place prearranged to live in. Finally, Brother Don Hazlitt and his wife Mabel Hazlitt went there as the initial missionaries. Don did a splendid work of finding homes and uh, purchasing homes at a very low price in those days where other missionaries could be accommodated. And finally, the permits came through for our group to go to Japan. The word cult is flung around pretty freely in here, and I've learned that this very concept, the concept of a cult, is also very new to Japan and didn't really come into use until the 1990s. And that is what made this manga so fascinating to me. You may have noticed that I am obsessed by differences in cultures and how that affects psychology. I love it. I love analyzing it. A majority of my videos are about Jehovah's Witness culture because they have such a weird and specific, very Stepford-y culture. Is that culture the same everywhere you go? Like they say that the Brotherhood is the same everywhere you go? And if it is, how does that clash with non-Western societies? And, indeed, from this manga, it seems that witness culture is almost exactly the same in Japan. A lot of the social experiences she talks about here, like people expecting you to drag your kids to the back to spank them and how funny everyone thinks it is when the child's screaming, that's something I saw in just about every Kingdom Hall I went to. They do it in Japan, they do it in Kansas. But while the culture of insular witnesses is the same, the way outsiders feel about witnesses is not the same. Everything about them is very strange, very foreign to outsiders, much more than here. And it's interesting to see exactly what aspects about it required more care to explain to a general Japanese audience. Seeing those differences reminded me of something Amber Scorer talked about in her book, Leaving the Witness, about her time as an undercover missionary in China. When you view your beliefs through the lens of a culture completely alien to you, the holes in the doctrine kind of point themselves. Sometimes you need that change in perspective to hear an unexpected interpretation of yourself that you haven't been primed already to shut down. You also begin to see the colonialism of it all that you miss living in a country that Christians have already dominated. But when the work really started to blossom was when families came in and families formed the foundation of the congregations. Since reading this, I've fallen down a bit of a rabbit hole trying to find the Japanese XJW community and what's going on over there because they might as well be on another planet as far as Americans are concerned. I don't know if everyone's heard but we are the universe. I rarely if ever hear anything uh, about what's going on over there. So I thought I'd find out. They don't have as strong of a presence on YouTube but they are big on blogging, which is actually pretty great for us because you can use translation tools pretty easily there. There's even more XJW manga on a whole bunch of blogs. I actually found one about growing up as a gay JW that's left me devastated that Google Translate doesn't work on pictures because I want to read it. Work on that please Google. What I have found is fantastic and it's interesting because they are having a very different conversation there. One of the first things you'll notice is that their profiles don't just say hashtag XJW. They also note which generation of XJW they are. So XJW2 for second generation, XJW3 for third generation, etc. The reason for this is because their current focus is childhood indoctrination. That is the big ticket issue there. Again, remember, Christianity is not dominant there. Japan is a polytheistic country. Their traditional religions are Shinto, Confucianism, and Buddhism, and they tend to practice them all together rather than, I am just a Buddhist, or I practice Shinto only. It's, it's not like a rigid religious structure there. It's more of a cultural tradition, kind of the way that Christmas here in America has become more of a cultural thing that everyone kind of celebrates, except <laughs> Jehovah's Witnesses. But for most people, it's only vaguely Christian. You know, it's what we do in December. Everyone likes it. It's fun. And we just like doing it. It's what you do. That's kind of how religion is in Japan for the most part. It's not really something that parents 
force on their kids. The concept of raising your child in the truth, baptizing them at a very young age, and expecting them to carry on practicing these beliefs as adults is not only a foreign concept to them, but they view it as child abuse on a national level. I know that we have some discussions about that here, but it's kind of just background noise while we focus on other things because... Well, this is a Christian country, and most Christian religions do this, so I think a lot of us just kind of, we've resigned ourselves to the reality of it, and even if we did make a big stink about it, most people wouldn't really see the big deal. In Japan, though, most people are in agreement on this. It's not a controversial take there to say that indoctrinating your child is abusive. Nearly Everything I've seen from XJWs in Japan focuses on this. There have been two documentaries on NHK this year regarding it, one of which actually the author of this manga was involved in. This is actually their reasoning behind their change in guidelines regarding blood transfusions, that it is unethical to impose your religious beliefs on your child before they have reached age and maturity for consent. They do have freedom of religion, but freedom of religion includes freedom to choose which religion you follow. So forcing your religion on your child is a violation of freedom of religion. I 100% agree with that. Because of how hard it can be to reintegrate into a society so heavily focused on education and career, children of Jehovah's Witnesses there say that they have lost their lives. They've lost their freedom. Freedom to go to school, freedom to build a career. They feel they've been left too far behind to attain a comparable life to their peers. Even freedom to marry. If it was a marriage, they were pressured into in the organization by the organization's rules and their procedures. Was even that marriage really their choice? There's also a lot of talk about the insular nature of Jehovah's Witness culture. We all know that witnesses keep to themselves, only making friends within the organization, and they keep everyone else at arm's length away. Which means when you are a witness, you are very immersed in witness culture, which is largely American culture. One of the blogs I found said that second and third generations of Japanese witnesses are serious victims in that they have been forced by their parents to a religion focused on the standards of American society. This is actually a way smarter article than all that that I just boiled it down to. They are talking about how cults like the Witnesses are a response to a problem with individualism and other American societal problems whose solutions make no sense to impose on people in Japan who don't really have the same problems. This is a really smart blog. Please check it out. It's interesting that with all of this, many of the Japanese XJW activists I found were new. Uh, they've had two television specials this year, and meanwhile, Lloyd Evans is reporting a sudden spike in sales for his book in Japan. And Jehovah's Witnesses put out a new music video in April in anime style. <laughs> I don't know if they're trying to appeal with a demographic they feel is at threat right now. Could just be a coincidence. I don't know, but uh, it's interesting. I really love the way the conversation is moving in Japan, and I wish there were a starker focus on the ethics of childhood indoctrination here. It is a very serious issue, and honestly, that's the only way that witnesses are really continuing on is by having babies and indoctrinating them. So if you get down to the root of the problem like they're trying to do in Japan, we could see some real impact. I'll link in the description some of the blogs and Japanese YouTubers I've found. You'll need translation tools to read it, of course, unless you know Japanese. If you didn't know already, you can get auto-generated YouTube translations by turning closed captions on then changing the language over to whatever you speak. It's not perfect, it's auto-translations, so it can be a little difficult to follow sometimes when, you know, it's mishearing what the person is saying and then mistranslating it to you. But for the most part, you get the gist of what they're saying. They have some really great ideas and a fresh perspective that I think is worth listening to. 
That's all I have for you today. I hope you found it as interesting as I did. Special thanks to Kaisaru on Twitter, who was so kind to talk to me and answer my many, many exhausting questions about all this stuff. Thanks as well to Sasha De Souza and all my supporters on Patreon. If you'd like to join them in supporting my channel, check out patreon.com slash mentally diseased. Otherwise, you can help out for free by liking the video, sharing the video, subscribing, and all that other fun stuff you hear about all the time. Thank you for watching, and take care, everybody.